Hello and welcome back to the Boomers Lecture Series. I'm so happy that you're back and I'm excited to share some cool things with you. Remember, I'm the orthodontic nerd that uh, in order to prove it, I thought I would t uh, tell you a quick story. When I was in seventh grade, I did my science fair project on orthodontic appliances. And on my little science fair table, I had Frankel appliances and Hollies and all different types of appliances. And the judges were not impressed. I did not win any awards. But it did lead me to where I am today, which is I love creating smiles. I love doing it with plastic. And I love trying to figure out better ways to do it with plastic. So that is uh, what we're going to talk about today. And so who is this guy talking to you? I have done a bunch of Invisalign. And I have been teaching at BCU for over 20 years in the orthodontic residency, mostly doing Invisalign. I'm kind of their Invisalign guy. I'm on Invisalign faculty, and I consider myself to be a boomer. And a couple more things. Let's see. So today we're going to talk about interdisciplinary communication and the lower incisor extraction secrets, which you may already feel great about, but I think I might have some other things to share that might help you get a great result faster. So remember, your next practice uh, boom could be boomers. And um, that's one thing I really want you to understand. So a quick recap. What is a boomer? Uh, Wikipedia says that it's people born between 1946 and 1964. Uh, I'm a little younger than that, but not far from it. According to the Urban Dictionary and my children, I'm a boomer because they call me boomer all the time. And why would you want to treat boomers? A couple quick, uh, again, a recap, a couple things. One is they really respect and listen to the doctor. They have money and they pay. Uh, the great cooperators, I just think it's an untapped market that really may be uh, something that you may not have considered and uh, something that I think you should consider in your practice for different reasons, especially as the dentists are taking more of the cases and, the, uh, and, and other places as well. So uh, why, are, why do I have this big boom? I think it's because it's really catching on with this population to have straight teeth. I think it makes them feel and look younger, and they like that without having to do surgery. And orthodontic treatment, especially with Invisalign, has just become so much easier and less visible and more convenient for, for the patients. Another quick recap. I love uh, looking at the aesthetics and figuring out using a smile template or just visually uh, mentally trying to figure out where they are. Here's a case where it really helped us figure out where the central incisors need to be and improve the bite tremendously, especially looking at it from the side and the, the angle of the upper incisors to the face. So let's talk about interdisciplinary communication. And the main thing I want you to think about is how you're going to visualize how the case is going to turn out and the different options. So imagine a world where there are straight teeth with canine guidance. So visualize what you're trying to achieve. And some of the main things to con consider are, what really is the patient looking for? Uh, do they want a full canine class wound relationship? Uh, do they have just one little problem in the, in the back with a tooth that's over into an edentulous space and they need to fix that? They don't need everything else. So uh, of course, going over the different options. And I have had a lot of patients in the past that say, yeah, I had this problem, but I while I'm doing it, I might as well fix everything else up at the same time. So we try to help the patient visualize. And a great way to do that is to use the ClinCheck setup. And you can share that very easily with them, of course. So getting uh, some great records to show them, of course. And, and I'll go over about doing some wax up with some printed models uh, in the future in another section. But that's a great way to communicate as well. And of course, setting their expectations, make sure they're not over promise things and uh, not just with their final result, but with their financial expectations as well. Uh, and not with just with us, but everything that will be involved with the, with the dentist and the periodontist and everyone involved. And you also have to make sure, of course, you're communicating with the dentist well and making sure they can understand. Another great way to use the ClinCheck is to share it with them. I often share my ClinCheck's with the dentist and uh, just it's a great way to look at spacing. And if I'm uh, trying to get to the same position that they are, and uh, of course, there are lots of different ways to do that. And you have to look and see what's you know, legally safe to do. Um, but how often to meet the Seattle Study Club, of course, has a great format for that, as, as does the Spear Study Club. But um, it's so helpful to, to look at these different ways. And of course, with a new way, it's 
it's uh, with Zoom with with all the with the pandemic and everything. And you have to set the expectations for the dentist as well. Sometimes they expect that you can do a lot of things like bring back all the upper teeth without bringing the lower teeth forward at all. Um, and you have to explain, yeah, we can do that. But we're going to need pads and uh, or some other type of method like taking teeth out. And so sometimes they don't quite understand that. So you have to explain it well. So my uh, thought is without good communication between your team, this is your final result compared to this being your final result with great communication between each other. And uh, it just makes such a big difference in your final result. Fonzie prefers the, uh, the, the interdisciplinary approach with good communication. And uh, there's me trying to be like, like the Fonzie really. So one important thing, uh, a great way to share information is to use the export button. I don't know if a lot of you are comfortable with this or use it often, but I use it all the time. I use it so much I put it up on my toolbar. I customize to put it up there. And when you open that up, there are lots of options. You can also just find it under your tool section. And uh, now if you're doing the, uh, the new software, um, you do have to go back underneath the new software when you open up the tab for the patient. You need to go uh, underneath that is something that shows you how to get to the old software, um, which is, uh, allows you to do the export still. So uh, once you push the export button in, in either place, uh, it opens up this screen. And the shared treatment plan is what I usually use with the dentist. It's a nice, easy way to send it over to a dentist and communicate with them. The movie is great for the patients because it just kind of shows the movement and the change. The screenshot, of course, is something just one static moment uh, that allows you to, to highlight one thing that you're looking at. Uh, the SDL I use a ton because I print out models a lot uh, from the beginning and the end, either for surgical cases or interdisciplinary cases. So I use that SDL quite a bit. And sample cases, I, I think, are mostly for lectures, so, um, but it can be used in other ways as well. So, uh, yeah, lots of, lots of great ways to do that. Here's an example. This is a VCU patient that had bulimia. Her front teeth actually looked great, and she wanted to keep the appearance of her front teeth. So the dentist came to us and said, hey, uh, we want to do lingual veneers. How about that? Lingual veneers uh, to strengthen and protect all these teeth. So uh, we went through and just kind of got the spacing correct. And, uh, and then we shared it with the dentist and they, you know, we went back and forth until we felt like the spacing was correct. Uh, two things about this. One is when you share the plan, you kind of have to do the plan twice. You kind of have to do the thumb check twice. Once for the dentist, so you can show the dentist and or the patient. And you, you can show them what you're expecting, what you're hoping to achieve. And then once you get that right, then you have to go back and redo the clean check and set it up for how you need to over do things like if you're correcting a deep bite, if you're going to add reverse curve or intrude the lowers, the dentist and patient don't need to see all that and it just confuses everyone. So what I recommend is that you do your first clean check to communicate with. And then once that's set up and you know where everything needs to be, then go back into your second clean check in a way that's going to basically uh, get the movement that you need by doing your over treatment. So that's one important thing. The other important thing I think is the next slide. Um, which is this one. Yes, uh, don't use a virtual C chain when leaving space for future buildups. And really, this is true for any time you're leaving space, whether it's for an implant or if you're leaving space for crowns or buildups or whichever. If you leave space and then you do a virtual C chain, you're just going to mess up the spacing you created and uh, end up with too little space. And so just remember this rule whenever you're leaving space, don't use a virtual C chain in that area. So here's a good interdisciplinary case. Uh, this patient came in and uh, I said, well, you know, um, I would love to get your teeth fixed up, but unfortunately, uh, I don't think we can move your teeth with them at this stage. So I had him go see a periodontist and I said, as soon as you get permission from the periodontist, come back and see us and we will get you fixed up. Now, to be honest with you, I did not expect that he would come back. Um, and uh, just because when I've seen this much calculus before, uh, it makes me worried that they're going to have teeth that are going to be uh, uh, salvageable and usable. I've done a lot of mission projects where people have teeth like this and you remove the calculus and they actually end up losing a tooth in some area. So I was very nervous that he was not going to be able to go forward with treatment. Of course, I explained that to him. Uh, he comes back in a year 
there's his bone. You can see some of the calculus on his Seth. And uh, overall, things look pretty good, except for the, just the severe calculus. He comes back in a year of looking like this, and he says, yeah, the period on this says I can go ahead. And I am just so excited that he is taking such good care of his teeth. The gums look awesome. The teeth look awesome. He has become one of my favorite patients ever. He's one of our best cooperators. He really makes a huge effort to take care of his teeth, and he's super excited to get a final result. So we decided to add an upper right canine and an upper left first premolar in terms of implants. So we're going to close the space. We're going to do some buildups or veneers for the upper laterals. And uh, so that's how we're moving forward. But we had to communicate, of course, uh, with the periodontist about the different options and if his teeth can move and then about the proper spacing. Then we talked with the dentist about how we're going to restore the laterals and the spacing needed for that. So we would share the ClinCheck and I basically put everything together for where I was hoping to get everything and building his ClinCheck uh, while communicating with the ClinCheck back and forth to the periodontist and the dentist. And uh, we got closer, not all the way there yet. Luckily, that space for the upper left premolar is better than it looks. The canine is a lot more buckle. And so anyway, here we are at our uh, one of our refinements, and we've made some nice big changes for him. Uh, looks a lot better, of course, with those ponics in, but we're really... Uh, Things are moving very nicely. I'm very happy with how everything's going. Here's our implants. Again, that upper left one doesn't look so great. Looks like it's in the bone. Uh, don't worry. The 3D model, show, the 3D uh, CBCT shows that that is just fine. You can see all the grafting as well. Uh, but it's healing well. It's not close to the root. Everything is safe there. Uh, now with our new ClinCheck with these canines, in, with these implants in, uh, we're getting that root uh, tucked in a little bit more. And uh, I'm still in a better position as we fine tune things. So here's where he is now. We're getting close here. We're just kind of fine tuning everything. Uh, we've met with the dentist again to go over the bonding for the, uh, well, um, hopefully veneers, but possibly bonding for the upper laterals. And also, um, you know, waiting for these implants to heal. And then we should be finished. So we're not far from being done with this guy. Again, one of the nicest, best patients I've ever had. And uh, I was um, a little nervous at first, but uh, I'm so glad that he proved me wrong. And I'm so glad of the, the wonderful progress that he's made. So, yeah, we went from there to there. Uh, you know, slight open bite, uh, some posterior constriction a little bit, and, uh, you know, missing some teeth. And we're in a much better position now. I can't wait to see how he finishes with his, with his last ones. So um, did you know that if you... Uh, use this toothpaste, you could actually be better at baseball. So that's kind of cool. Uh, yeah, I love some of these old commercials. They're pretty awesome. So when it comes to here comes the boom for interdisciplinary, of course, communicating is super important. And I like to use that export button to really share my plan and communicate well with them. Uh, prepare the patients for change and for compromise and uh, make sure they have good expectations. You know, everyone knows all this. These are all the things we were taught in our residency and in dental school. And uh, but still super important to remember and understand. Um, I just love trying different treatment plans in the ClinCheck. I'll try one and then I'll try a different one and compare it. One of the tricks, though, is really understanding what you think will happen versus what the, the ClinCheck shows you. Uh, I've often heard I love the saying, don't believe the cartoon. Um, and um, I completely agree with that. Sometimes it'll show you a an amazing result. I'll show you an example of that in a second, which is actually quite dangerous and can further really put the patient at risk. So you, with our orthodontic knowledge, luckily we can understand when something is going beyond what's realistic. So um, yeah, overtreat. I overtreat everything, opening up spaces, correcting deep bites, open bites, everything. I do a lot of overtreatment, uh, rotating canines, that sort of thing. And um, one of my favorite things to do that really work, works well for reminding me to do things is I use a, uh, and the, most softwares have something to pop up and say penicillin allergy. So every time you open the chart, the first thing that pops up says penicillin allergy or, or whatever uh, concern you may have that you need to be reminded about every time. So I use that all the time for stuff besides uh, health concerns. Sometimes I'll have something that'll pop up that'll say, uh, implant for the upper right canine, you know, something I didn't, don't normally do. You know, normally I would do it for a premolar, 
But if I'm doing something different and I need to be reminded every time so I don't have to go through the whole chart and figure things out, I like to have some reminders. Or watch out for that inadequate attached gingiva, or what I would just put as watch IAG. So I use that alert reminder all the time to remind me certain things so I don't forget them while I'm treating the patient. It can be uh, a nice way to, uh, to make sure you're not forgetting something very important for that case. So let's talk about some Lauren Sizer extraction uh, secrets. So remember I said, don't believe the cartoon. These are real cases from Richmond. This is a, uh, a case that was sent to me uh, to try to get the roots back into the bone. Uh, apparently the clenshack looked great when they were finished and uh, um, but what they didn't show was the bone this was not done by an orthodontist and uh, unfortunately they really didn't understand the limitations as to how far teeth could move it looked great in the clenshack but in real life it sure can be dangerous here's another similar case where you can see they were uh, they truly pushed the teeth out of bone uh, unfortunately this is not faring well for the dentist and with a lawsuit and certainly not for the patient as well not only will they lose that uh, lower right incisor, they're also going to lose their lower left second, uh, the lateral incisor, and uh, not the second, the lateral. Um, but they're probably going to lose uh, and they, their the lower left canine uh, is at risk as well. So this poor patient, you know, had nice healthy, a nice healthy relationship, but when the um, when they ended up pushing the teeth out of bone, it really messed things up a lot. So lower incisor extraction is one of my favorite things to, is to look at a case and say, which tooth did I extract again? Because I, I couldn't remember. And so it's kind of fun to look back and see. Um, so uh, why do you see more lower incisor extraction cases for boomers? I believe in mesial drift. I think the lower teeth slowly drift forward over time. And, uh, and I think that leads to the lower crowding. And, um, and then they have more lower crowding than in the upper. And uh, a lot of times there's also a compromised tooth, which may be related to that or not. It's hard to tell. But uh, my, my patient selection for this is um, so sometimes not all these, sometimes just some of them. But if they're slightly class three, uh, if there's a small, up, a small upper laterals or big lower premolars and they have a bolt discrepancy, uh, sometimes I'll do this. And sometimes, of course, I'll do IPR. Square lower teeth help because when you have square lower teeth, uh, you have less chance of dark triangles afterwards, but you can't always uh, get that. Um, if there's a risk of perio for lower anteriors or a lot more uh, uh, crowding in the lower, then extractions might be a good choice. And also when the lowers are really flared to begin with and there's crowding, uh, that sure makes me nervous that we're going to bring them out even further. So my secret, my biggest secret for, for uh, closing the space is to first create space on either side of the two. So first I lean the teeth together until there's at least a millimeter of space distal to them. And that's why I put it in the instructions. And then I have the pressure here so that I can push the, uh, now I really have more plastic on the distal of these teeth in order to push them together to bring everything together. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of my biggest secret. And that's how this patient, you can see not much upper crowding, a lot of lower crowding, and uh, the, the lower, I just feel like if I were to just try to do this with IPR, I'd push the teeth out of bone. Uh, you can see the upper incisors and lower incisor angulations are pretty decent. Bone looks good. So um, this is, I didn't take pictures, unfortunately, after 15 months. But this is after the, um, after 15 months, we uh, got things pretty much finished. And uh, this is back when I was doing two weeks each, so it took a lot longer. Uh, but now we have... Um, and then we, you know, finished up pretty nicely with the case. Uh, she was sure happy with everything. And it's not perfect, but it shows you how you can really make things work well. Now I do one week each and I really get about the same time. Uh, I get about the same result in terms of the number of aligners I go through. But it, in other words, it happens much faster than that. It doesn't happen in 15 months. It happens in less than a year usually. So, yeah, so there's like before and after for that case. Um, so a couple of things to remember with space closure is the center of rotation. So if you think about just pulling these teeth together with a chain, either with, uh, and here I'm talking about using auxiliaries, because sometimes I will use auxiliaries. And if you just pull the teeth together with a chain uh, as an auxiliary, uh, then what happens is they rotate around the center of rotation, and then the teeth just lean together like this. Um, and, uh, and so... Um, and same thing if you don't have the aligners in or if you don't have a wire and you just have uh, two attachments and bring them together, they're going to rotate like this, of course. 
So I explain this to the patients and make sure they understand that if we're using auxiliaries in the chain, you've got to wear these aligners better than ever because otherwise you're going to get some weird side effects and it's going to cause your treatment to take even longer. So that's super important. But what I really wanted to show you with this is once the teeth are touching or once there's plastic, when there is plastic between the teeth, the center of rotation actually changes. It actually becomes where there is the fulcrum here. So if you pull these two teeth together in a way that's below the contact point, like this, then what you're going to do is you're going to actually cause these teeth to rotate uh, to the roots towards each other because they're going to work off that fulcrum, and that's going to help bring the roots together uh, because of the distance there. Now, if you um, if you have aligners, the, the aligners act as the, pl the plastic, they act as, as the fulcrum, and that's what's going to be what brings them together uh, in a similar way. So if they're wearing the aligners, that'll work. It'll prevent the side effects from going in the wrong direction, but they have to wear them incredibly well. Another thing to take into consideration is if you if you pull them together at the fulcrum, uh, that's when it's a problem because you're really not doing anything. You're just pulling the teeth towards each other. So keep that force low with your auxiliaries if you use them with, with space closure and getting the roots together because uh, otherwise they're, they're just pulling right into the, the center of rotation and nothing will happen. Um, so again, keep it, you need to keep it low. Keep it towards the gingiva and that's going to make the difference of getting these roots together or not. Good, so a quick review here. Case selection, super important. First tilt the teeth, then toward the, the roots towards each other. Um, one of my favorite things about doing lower incisor extractions with Invisalign, I prefer to do with Invisalign, um, just because you're able to take the tooth out and put that, uh, have a tooth in right away, you know, and you can, some people will start and do a couple of aligners first and tell them, tell, tell Invisalign to actually extract the tooth a couple of aligners in, and that way they take the tooth out as you're going through treatment. It gives kind of a, a bigger window when you can have the tooth out. I usually schedule it so that they, have the tooth out and we deliver the aligners the, the same or the next day. So anyway, yeah, so um, yeah, with bad breath can really cause some problems and so make sure you brush with Colgate. Uh, next time we're going to talk about braces segments, one of my favorite things to talk about. And um, remember, em embrace the rewards found in trading boomers and uh, try to learn the tricks to do it well. Don't forget there's lots of great information with Aligner Insider. So many good. Uh, so much good information that you can benefit from. So part three is coming up soon. I hope that was helpful for you, and I'll see you soon.